Hi, thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Race to Walk, and I am here today with Mark Andrew Ritchie, and he is an author, he is an evangelist, and he is also, uh, in his day job, uh, he was very well known as a commodities trader. So he's going to talk to us a little bit today about a very special project that he has been working on and has made available. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of his other books because he's written quite a number of them and they're all in uh, very different, very different. So um, he actually, uh, in his professional life, he was a, a commodities trader and actually very well known. He wrote two books uh, on those types of topics. And one is God in the Pits, which is sort of his um, spiritual autobiography. Um, and he discusses, you know, being a Christian in the um, in that world. And also he wrote my trading Bible, which if any of you who are in to uh, trading, you might be very interested in this book because he has a lot of, of insights and a lot of knowledge in this area. And then the other types of books that he has are more um, Christian-based. And the first book that I came in contact with him from was his book, Spirit of the Rainforest. Um, if you watched any of my v reviews on my YouTube channel or on read them on my website, I do refer to this book a lot. And um, I'll link to this uh, the information on this book also. But he also has another novel called The Last Shibboleth and also an, another book called The Signs and Testimony of Johan. And then his next book that's coming out is I Once Was Blind. Uh, we we'll, might have to do another show on that one. But what we're going to be talking about today is the treasures of my heart. And so I'm going to let Mark take it from here and tell you a little bit more about himself and then also a little bit about treasures of my heart. Well, I got to tell you, Carla, your uh, intro there was uh, more than what uh, I deserved and uh, almost brought tears to my eyes. Here, here's, what, here's what inspired me to do this particular book and the same thing that inspired you to do the in that, that intro. Who is this character? Who is this character from 2000 years ago and how did he possibly 
invade our lives today. It, it's a, th this is a mystery and you can't blame our uh, uh, fellow uh, scholars who are either agnostics or atheists to being totally mystified as to how he ever invaded our world as he did. For, I'll give you an example. The, the, in, in the book that, that I'm working on and reading, there's almost a whole chapter dedicated to just one person, a, a religious person, a religious rabbi who, who was so uh, ashamed of even coming to him. He, he, he came up to him at night. There's another whole chapter devoted to one woman that he ran into at the well. And that woman was so unpopular, she couldn't even get anybody to come to the well with her. She was a five-time loser in romance. Uh, and, and he's spending his time with this one person, and they dedicate a whole chapter to this one person. There's another one person. They had a big argument about who the, who the big sinner was, this person or his parents, that he was born blind. And they dedicate a whole chapter to this one blind person. Jesus hardly appears in the chapter, and the, the blind person has an argument with the religious leaders, and it goes on and on what, with one one insignificant person who they threw out of the synagogue because they told him you were born in sin. You're not even worth being here. How is it? Here, here's my question, Carla. How is it that this person who had one contact with another, one-on-one, -on -one, can today be the most popular, influential, life-changing person uh, on, on the globe? This is a mystery. And so I went back and I thought, let me see if I can recover some of the reality of what really happened inside some of these people. And that caused me to put together this book, which you showed the, the cover of, just to try to give an idea. We know a, a few things. First of all, this young girl, after she gave birth to the most mysterious baby she could give birth to, we had to know she was confused about the whole thing. It says that when these shepherds came, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mm -hmm. He herself wasn't real clear about everything that was going on. And her husband, Joseph, had to be as mystified as anyone. And they take the kid and run away to Egypt based on some dreams that they had. So I have just supposed that Mary kept a, a, a whole pile of documents. And I've piled them up here. One of them right here, this first one, is the breakup letter that Joseph probably might have written to Mary. We know that he needed to put her away. He had to put her away. He wasn't going to stone her as the law might have required, but he certainly feared for her life. So he wrote this breakup letter to her, uh, which had to break her heart, of course. And uh, then later he gets a dream which, uh, which he was convinced came from an angel, uh, which said, uh, take her for your wife. And, you know, the, the rest is history. But so I have just gathered up piles of documents. We know, Carla, that there was a group of scribes, probably from Galilee, in, in the area of Judea, in, a, in and around Jerusalem, who wrote reports on what was going on there, uh, very much like first century reporters, so they could spread it around to uh, other areas of, uh, of the Israel uh, where people could not get necessarily to the festivals. Although most of the, the attendance at these festivals was tremendous and the Mount of Olives was full of campers and squatters uh, during, that, uh, during those festivals. We think that uh, that Mary and Joseph probably uh, spent most of their time over on the other side of the Kidron, Kidron Valley. No one knows for sure. But what I've tried to do here is just gather up all the reports that uh, might have been made 
uh, during the uh, during that time, uh, following the following the crucifixion, for example. Three days later, they were missing a body. They were so concerned about this that the guards who were supposed to have been guarding the body reported to the Sanhedrin and said, we got a problem. And the Sanhedrin paid them off. The same as they paid off uh, Judas to get Jesus in the first place, they paid off the guards and said, we'll give you cover um, and, and they concocted a story. Why did they concoct this story? And all, all of this is, is reported here in one story after another by these scribes, because if they could have gone to the, to the grave and, and brought this body out, they would have solved the problem that they had right there on what we call Easter Sunday morning. They had a big problem because they didn't have a body. Mm-hmm. They needed to do was come up with a body that they could prove. Look, look at this body. The, the body's got uh, scars in the hands. It's got scars in the feet, even as a scar in the side where we remember we, we punctured his side to make sure he was dead. And if they could have paraded that through the streets, this thing would have been over in about uh, 24 hours. But they didn't have the body. Yeah, you know, I was, uh, I think I read this on one of the uh, Bibli- uh, Bible archaeology websites. They were talking about the, um, the practice of preparing the body for burial. And the, what they said was that the women going three days later was not just a coincidence. That was when they literally went to go and do the final preparations for the, you know, for the, uh, for burial. So he was laid in the tomb, but they would wait three days. And didn't they believe like the spirit left after, truly left after three days, and then they would do the final preparations. So the women were just going to do the standard practice. Like, mm-hmm. so it wasn't, um, they were just, they, they were waiting for that time. They had a unique burial practice, uh, only lasted for about 100 years, in which they had an ossuary, a box about, about this size, uh, if, if you can say, uh, anyway, a, a box l- large enough to, to hold the, the, the longest bone of the body, which are the, the, the femur or the humerus, the, 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 the leg bones. And yes, and then a year after the death, they would go back and collect those bones, put them in that box and, uh, and store that box. That particular burial habit only lasted for about 100 years. But uh, I can tell you, if they could find the bone box of Jesus, uh, that would be the uh, greatest archaeological find of all time. Uh, in fact, they have uh, found the bone box of is it James? Uh, and yeah, mm-hmm. the, the brother, the brother of Jesus, and uh, of course that's been controversial whether whether or not it's a fake. Um, uh, time will tell on that. But the uh, the thing that that uh, proved it to be a fake was the fact that brother was misspelled. But it just shows you once again that those of us two thousand years later don't know everything about the first century, and in actual fact that what we thought was a misspelling of brother was an alternate spelling of brother, which was fully accepted in the first century. So and the, the point is this, this has been my attempt to show exactly, or at least a little more, uh, what it might have been like to have been in the first century. And that's why the, the actual format, I don't even know if this qualifies as a book, the, mm-hmm. the format of the book you you have one uh so it's almost like an exhibit it it it, i I want a person who's reading it to 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 feel the transportation of themselves back to another time another place another century another uh uh, an opportunity for them to imagine what this might have been like because uh there's no denying that this person has uh, influenced history to the point that that we we schedule our calendar uh, with respect to the year that he was born. 
Not quite, mm-hmm. not quite accurate, of course, but at least that's our uh, that's our goal anyway. Uh, yeah. So, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the format itself? Because that that alone is a really interesting story. Well, I wanted to show first of all, of course, the handwritten nature of the thing. Uh, mm-hmm. So I got. Uh, do you want me to put the slides up with um, pictures? Yeah, if you if you have them, oh, probably, okay, probably better than my pictures, which just go like this. Yeah, there's there's one. Uh, <clears throat> you're you're going to be shocked to hear that I got almost all of this handwritten by uh, children in a refugee camp in uh, in Thailand. They're Karen refugees escaping from the the war in oh. uh, in Burma in Myanmar. Uh, there's a there's a report of the corpse that was found near Jericho. They found a corpse. They thought it might have been him. There it is. Yeah, yeah. The remains of a mm-hmm. crucified man were found today in a small grave outside of Jericho. Something it might have been the stolen body of the rabbi from Nazareth, uh, but it wasn't. It didn't uh, turn out to be. But there's one of the one of the gals who did the uh, the handwriting uh, for it. So it has a it has a an authentic feel of, and each one of them took a different character that they wrote for. Uh, that's a, a nine-year-old kid. I'm trying to remember remember his name just now, but uh, he uh, he wrote for one of the stories is uh, was written for a uh, a synagogue in Bethsaida, and they told a story about uh, uh, some fish that they caught, and they took it. To, they became the children, the, the guys who had the the fish and the loaves uh, that were multiplied, and they they wrote a story about that. And he became the the, uh, the guy who wrote the kids' story uh, on that particular occasion. So each one of the children took a character, depending on what their handwriting looked like. There they are, uh, doing lining up in their. Uh, we set up a table in uh, one of the buildings in their refugee camp, and uh, I got a bunch of uh, scribal uh, pens, um, and they became. Uh, they became first century scribes and uh, and kids writing stories and uh, I think one of one of these gals wrote for Mary and uh, the others that had more formal uh, handwriting wrote for some of the uh, scribes uh, who who were doing their scribing and it was uh, it was quite a project and then of course we had to to get it all onto uh, paper um, in in Thailand they have. Um, they have all different kinds of paper made from all different kinds of stuff uh, to uh, to be uh, very uh, accurate. They have what they call uh, elephant poop paper. Uh, I, I can't, uh, you know, there's uh, plenty of elephants in Thailand. I can't uh, believe that they actually make the paper from elephant poop, but uh, that, that's what they call it. And uh, I wouldn't doubt it. There's all kinds of things you can make paper from. You uh, will be interested to know that actually we simulated papyrus, but there were two kinds of paper in the first century. One was papyrus, the other was vellum. And at that time, the the, the scroll was being uh, was evolving into a. Let me see if I have one here. Something here. was just tending to flatten out. So it was evolving into a, a thing where you could uh, turn actual uh, pages of the scroll doubled up. It was on its mm-hmm. way to evolve into a book. By the second century, it had uh, evolved into a book that could actually be bound a little bit like this. I want to see if I have one here. Uh, I think I, I'm sure I do, but I, whether I can get it uh, for you well, it remains to be seen. Let's see. Um, it kind of unfolds a little bit. Yeah, here's one. You, you can sort of see it. It, it was. It might have been a scroll at one time, uh, but but then over time, it, it sort of flattens out like that and uh, gets tucked into. Here, here's another one. Uh, it really is a 
it's, it's written as one big piece, but instead mm -hmm. of rolling it up, they, they sort of fold it a little bit like an accordion. Anyway, it was a, it was a project that has just uh, uh, really but it became sort of the um, uh, a labor of love to mm -hmm. get to see if I could duplicate what the kind of stuff that Mary might have stacked up. And mm -hmm. probably the last third of it is all about the controversy of, uh, of the authorities of the day trying to find the body, um, all of which sort of almost culminated uh, or came to a, a, a climax with the uh, stoning of Stephen. Mm -hmm. And that's when uh, there began to be some very serious doubt, certainly in the mind of the Apostle Paul, about whether or not these people were uh, running a con game or, uh, or whether they really believed what they were saying. Had they stolen the body? Did they concoct this whole story? Or, or were they uh, sincere uh, in, in what they were saying? And... You know, Carla, I have always wondered, what did Jesus say? What was his message on, the, on that two-hour walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus? Because mm -hmm. the disciples, after they recognized him, they said, weren't our hearts burning with us while he opened unto us the scriptures? Well, if you look in the book of Acts, just prior to Stephen's death, he, he gives the history from the Old Testament. And I, I'm just guessing, it's a guess on my part, that it's very possible that Stephen's sermon uh, in the book of Acts is almost identical to what Jesus was sharing with them as they were walking uh, on the road to Emmaus. And uh, there's, uh, there's two reactions to that story. One is our hearts burned within us. And the other one is we gotta do away with this guy. They were so mm -hmm. they, they couldn't answer Stephen. They could not respond to his, his uh, articulation that the scriptures, that the, the scriptures that the Jewish, the Jewish Bible laid out in advance uh, what Mashiach was going to look like and that he needed to suffer first and give his life a ransom for many. And th that was more than they could deal with. So there was nothing they could do with him except the same thing they had done with Christ. And uh, his reaction was very similar uh, to that. Yeah. And that had to have had a profound effect on Saul, who was ga gathering the garments of the uh, execu executioners at that time. You know, I, um, I read this, this book on, um, it's called The Later Herods. It was by Stuart Perrowin. Uh, it was published, I think, in the 1950s. The only way you can get it, I, I think there's like only like three or four copies on WorldCat. The only way you can really get one is by doing a used bookseller, you know, that's, that's do, exactly right. yeah. So anyway, um, it was really so there, interesting. Has there been a book you haven't read? <laughs> I wish, I wish. I, I, the last couple of years have really showed me like my lack in, uh, I, I, I'm reading Alastair McIntyre right now in a book club who like pretty much knows every single philosopher ever. Yeah. And, uh, oh, anyway. So, um, but what it really showed me was that, because it was after Herod the Great. So it wasn't specifically about you know, the, the time when Jesus was there, it was like towards the latter half, the first part of the church, but it really showed, um, the dynamics that were going on, a lot of the maneuverings of different factions. And it really helped me see, um, that, you know, cause when I read it, it was right after this thing that happened locally. And I was just so disappointed in people. It's like, you know, people are just out for themselves and they, you know, they don't care about the truth. Yeah. And it just made me realize that people haven't changed. It's things are exactly the same today as they were then. And people would literally rather just like people would rather die of COVID rather than admit that they're wrong. They would, they would literally deny God himself 
rather than give up what they think their position is. They, they don't want to accept the truth because this truth doesn't suit them. And it just, um, it really helped me, I don't know, it helped me get a picture of the time better, I think, reading that book. And I think that your book can help people get a sense of what the time was like and mm -hmm. like try to imagine and put themselves in it because it's so easy for us especially the longer you've been in church i think the harder it is to really grasp the reality of it sometimes because we tend to put our stuff on top of jesus and on top of what he said versus really like thinking okay what did he actually say what is he saying what does he expect of us it uh, it takes time. It it, uh, it actually there's there's two there's two ways to see the light. Sometimes it takes time. C.S. Lewis it took him a, a, a quite a period of time. In fact, there, there's a story about him coming out. I think in theaters uh, may, maybe next month. Yes, the, the doctor, world. doctor, our, my, one of my professors is in it actually. Yeah. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I I went to it. It came. It, uh, Max McLean, unbelievable, unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable talent. He came here to Indianapolis and performed the thing as a one a one man show. Unbelievable. And he took a Q and A afterward, and uh, I I got to ask the last question, and I I so I asked him how did he as C S Lewis he's being C S Lewis how did he actually move I, we we know he moved from his uh, atheism to theism but how did he move from theism what was that step like he never really uh, he never really communicated very, very clearly well uh mclean said now wait a minute i'm uh, max mclean i'm not I, I, I said you're not going to get out of it that easy uh you, you've been him for the last two hours you got to uh, tell us how he did that well it it, it takes some time uh, occasionally someone like saul on the road to damascus will have uh, an epiphany a sudden epiphany but even then, I don't think it was sudden because he saw Stephen. He, he heard the word. He saw Stephen prove how much he believed it and so forth. So when he saw the light on the road to Damascus, he knew exactly what he was up against. Now, there, there are some. Howard Storm is a, is a pretty good example. He had a near-death experience mm -hmm. in which he saw the light. But it, uh, unless you have a unique experience like that, it takes a lot of time for a person to recognize that he's wrong. And it takes a lot of patience on our part to actually deal with him. We don't know what went on in Nicodemus in that early encounter with Jesus, but later, later Nicodemus is saying to his group, wait a minute, we don't judge somebody without giving them a hearing. And their response to him was, are you from Galilee? <laughs> And, and, and then, then a years later, he takes the body of Jesus along with Joseph. So we, we, uh, we need to have a lot of patience with people whose worldview is uh, very confused. I, uh, I have one philosopher, spent 40 years teaching philosophy at, in one of the universities in California, <clears throat> brilliant philosophical mind, and did a... a articulate interview three days before he died mm -hmm. in which he said, we want to know what the, what is the meaning of life? And his conclusion was, it's a meaningless question. Okay. There is a brilliant philosopher admitting that the meaning of life is a meaningless question. And what do we say? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think the meaning of life is probably the most important question ever. And who knows, maybe in his last few days, he had a chance to reconsider that. But what I'm saying is, here's a guy at the end of his life uh, who's set in his ways. And if you're going to get out of those, it's going to take a while. And it's going to take an honest mind. And it's going to take a person willing to face a whole lot of different truth. The, uh, the great uh, agnostic uh, Jastro said... Uh, I'm a materialist, a philosophical materialist. I'm a scientist. Now, all there is is material. Once you do all the material, you uh, analyze all the atoms and all the, you, you've done everything you can. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, he said, I suspect there's something more. And here's the interesting thing he said in his last quote. He said, I won't discover that 
in my lifetime. Now, why would an agnostic who thinks all there is is material stuff suggest that he might have a chance to, to discover that after his lifetime? Even, yeah. he, even he knows something inside him, not having nothing to do with anything material, is saying, there, I, I, I might get an answer to this. In my next lifetime, I think there might be a next lifetime, even though all my science tells me something else. So it's, it's, these things take time. For Well, I kind of agree with that. But the issue is that, um, you know, the Holy Spirit is always working. You know, he's always calling to us whether we believe God or not. It's just that when we are a Christian, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so... The thing is, you have to be willing to admit that you're wrong. And if you're not, it doesn't matter how much truth you come to. Every single person comes to a moment of truth, right? And what you do with that, if you refuse to deny truth, then you're choosing deception. And you're, you're hardening your heart a little bit. You're, you're closing. But when continue to go down that path that is the unforgivable sin it's quenching the holy spirit as jesus said um you know whoever dies, denies the son of man can be forgiven whoever denies the holy spirit can never be forgiven either in this world or in the world to come because that is a spirit of truth he's the one that leads us he's the one that guides us and if we refuse to acknowledge truth if we refuse to admit when we're wrong then we've chosen, you know, we, we've chosen deception. Uh -huh. And, and this is a thing like, it, it just going back to, you know, I know a lot of times people will say, well, if, if the Jews saw all this stuff, if they saw all these miracles and all these things that Jesus did, and he brought back people from the dead and he healed the blind. And he, not only did he come back to, uh, from the dead, but people saw him and the, the, uh, you know, the hearing of hell where these other people were, uh, came back from the, you know from the dead and were walking around testifying to Jesus as a Messiah and they they didn't like leave they were like they lived you know among these people all these times so these were additional witnesses how could they deny it and it's like it goes back to that sense of pride that that I don't want to admit that I'm wrong and you know I I have Jewish friends I've during this pandemic I've heard a lot of Jewish um, teachings and this is the thing they're very careful about the things that they read and mm -hmm. they 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 have you know there's this Jewish mysticism called Kabbalah where they get into gematria where yeah. they, they they create all this other layer of meaning because if you just read what it says you can't ignore that Jesus is a messiah if Jesus isn't the messiah the Jews aren't getting one the whole Bible is a big joke throw it out he is it. He's the one that every single prophet has pointed to. But then they can't they can't read it. And then the stuff that they do read, they put this whole other layer of nonsense on it so they can make it say what they want to say. So anyway, you, we choose. We choose. Uh, the, a, a politician said recently, I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, I, it was too recent. But uh, I'm, I'm going to write about it in my, my upcoming book. Uh, his quote was, we choose the truth over facts. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, this politician is prone to gaffes, you know, so we enjoy his gaffes. And I always enjoy a politician who just uh, bl blurts it out, just puts it mm -hmm. out there, however it comes out. But what he means by that is, don't confuse me with the facts. I've got my truth. I've got my mm -hmm. interpretation of the facts. It reminds me, I, I don't know if, it, I have time for this story. My buddy goes out drinking, drink, he, he mixes gin and water and he gets drunk. The next night he mixes whiskey and water and he gets drunk. The next night he mixes rum and water and he gets drunk. And he says, you know what the truth is? I'm drinking too much water. <laughs> the, commonality, the, 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 the commonality, I gotta cut out this water. Okay, that's his truth. The facts, we know what the facts are. But the truth is, I'm drinking too much water. I got to cut out the water. I'll stick with the gin and the tonic and the w w whatever. Um, and what this politician is saying is, we have our view of the world. 
and the facts aren't going to confuse us about it. And mm -hmm. that's what's that's what's going on here, uh, Carla. And it's going to take time for people to bat their head against a wall of confusion. And uh, I, I, we're, we're not getting into politics here. I, I, we, we don't need to do that. But uh, the, the whole issue of uh, a, a well-known guy, uh, David Rubin, just gave up his atheism. That was a couple did, years ago, right? Yeah. How did he do that? He gave it up because uh, the, the facts that were battering uh, against his head uh, were, were irrefutable. The same thing is true with the, the, the great atheists that I read uh, all through my philosophical studies in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Anthony Flew. Mm -hmm. Anthony Flew gave up his atheism not because he read something in the scripture which proved to him that there was a God. He gave up his atheism because there was so much information in a DNA molecule, in a DNA atom, he could not deny that, that all of that intelligence had to come from somewhere. And intelligence doesn't happen by accident. Yeah. And so he gave up his, at the age of 80, here's a guy, the, the facts battered his head for 40 years and he, uh, uh, repented of his atheism. Like I say, some of these things take time. And of course, you and I, we know that there's a Holy Spirit out there. And I'll say to uh, crowds, I've said it to my uh, crowds in Pakistan, I could, I, you, an American could stand here and tell you this stuff. But I also know that there's a God inside you who's, who's nagging inside your brain saying that the guy might look like a foreigner. He might talk like a foreigner. He might uh, have a skin color that's different from yours, but the same voice that bothers me is bothering them. And, and they recognize it. They, they can see it as well. Yeah. I mean, but the thing is we can quench that if, if we choose not, if we choose well, to reject it, we can quench it. But well, one of my, yes. one of my pastors, um, he used to say that, you know, sometimes we can have information problems. We, we don't know a thing because we haven't been taught or we have wrong beliefs because that's what we were taught. And the thing is, if, if it's an information problem, then giving correct information will, will fix it. If it's a spiritual problem, more information is not going to fix it because it's a spiritual problem. And I think that's what we're dealing with. There's tons of information out there, you know, but it's a spiritual problem. I mean, and I would say this. Um, so Mark has uh, been ministering in Pakistan, uh, you know, teaching a Bible study. And he was, uh, I, I dropped in this morning and he was um, kind of sharing some of, you know, our failings in the West, you know, about things that we do and um, how we act and, that we don't, uh, we fail in uh, exhibiting hospitality. Which, if you look, you know, back, you know, back from the very beginning, you know, there's there's judgments for not extending hospitality to strangers, to foreigners, to people in need, right? But the other thing too is like I think that we as a church, we just think we got got the lockdown on it and we don't think that we even need God anymore. I think we make, we decide what he's, we think he should do and what he should say. And there's no, um, there's no repentance. There's no self check. There's no, uh, even, I, I don't know. It's just, I don't know. It's just been a discouraging few years, honestly. And you actually, I think, you know, looking at the, your books that you've written, you deal with that inner corruption a lot. Like in your, your trading Bible, in the book you have coming out, in God in the Dock. Um, you yeah, I, I, have, uh, I have said, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I want to say this publicly, but uh, that um, you, you, you might not remember in the 80s, uh, Rudy Giuliani uh, became famous 
when he uh, rooted, rooted out some corruption in, in the uh, stock market in New York. And mm -hmm. he, 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 Ivan Bosky uh, went to uh, Stanford and he made famous the line, uh, greed, for lack of a better word, can be good. Mm -hmm. and, and Giuliani became famous by doing that. And his uh, assistants came to Chicago. And they went into the pits in Chicago where I trade and, and had little uh, and bugged uh, stuff. And they were there to uh, root out the corruption of Chicago. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, to give you an example, Boski paid a hundred million dollar fine and spent some time in jail and a number of his underlings the same thing. In Chicago, uh, they arrested some people and they said, what do you know about Mark Ritchie? And they, they tried to, um, they, they tried to, to do this, to, to make themselves famous. In mm -hmm. fact, in fact, they accused one of my friends. Uh, they uh, put him on trial for stealing $12 and 50 cents from a client that he, he spent about a quarter of a million dollars defending himself. Uh, they couldn't get a conviction. And so they tried him again. Uh, they tried him until he had no money left and he had to cop a plea to uh, 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 admitting to stealing $12.50. They got about half a dozen people for stealing $12.50 in Chicago. They left town rather humiliated and didn't make a career themselves. You never heard of any of them. You know, they, they never got the career that Giuliani got because and, and in the wake of that, I have said on uh, a number of occasions, many Christian institutions are not honest enough to be a trader at the Chicago Board of Trade. Yeah. Uh, that's a sobering thought, uh, but um, I have seen it and, uh, and we've seen it and uh, we, we've seen a lot of Christian uh, organizations come down, but in actual fact, an awful lot of it, I was sitting, I was sitting at a dinner one time in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. And it was a dinner that was uh, sponsored by a, a not-for-profit. And, and the guy sitting next to me, and we, we were talking about this. And he said, yeah, look at this table. And he started counting around this table. Look, that, 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 that. All of these people are having a dinner on uh, donated dollars, dimes. That's not proper. It's being written mm -hmm. off uh, improperly. Uh, so, yes, I, I share your uh, discouragement about this, and uh, I, I hope that uh, all of these uh, Christian leaders are not uh, watching this because they'll come down uh, on me with a, uh, like a ton of bricks. I have said for years, and th th oh, this, this will really end, end, end me, uh, that the 501c3, it's time to end the 501c3 uh, because the, the, the government does not have the ability to tell the difference between a legitimate uh, organization and uh, on one that's in, in paying for uh, the terrorism or worshiping the devil or who knows, you know, sacrificing uh, uh, black cats and, and occasionally human beings. Uh, in any case, well, all you're saying is, yes, you're a little bit uh, you're a little bit disappointed at the lack of uh, of uh, spiritual maturity of uh, a lot of uh, what's going on. And uh, the answer to that is. Uh, Carla, that you and I need to concentrate our own spiritual maturity. Not, yeah, not. actually, that's that's part of that's part of why my uh, you know this is the thing about like YouTube and different like influences influencing platforms. It's it's there's certain ways. It's really easy to get a lot of followers. Like in the Christian sphere. You just uh, say you have a rapture dream or have a new word from God or, you yeah. know, attack, attack big name people and you're, you'll get a lot of views. You'll get a lot of people following you. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, we have to realize that every single one of us, if we're going to be uh, called to account for every idle word we speak, then I think it's important that what we put out, that we make sure that it's something that we're willing to put before God himself and say, this is what I have had. This is what I did with it. And we want to be able to say that we want him to be able to say, well done, not like yeah, give yeah. us a look like, 
really. And yeah. I think that, um, you know, so what I focus on is Bible studies and I mean, they're kind of they're the verse by verse Bible studies, because I think a lot of people, you know, even in the church, I don't think they're very familiar with the Bible. They maybe know a few verses, but they don't know the context. That's one of the reasons why I love your um, your scrapbook and some of the other things that you do. You even though it's not specifically uh, it's not a Bible study, obviously, but it's giving these elements of context. So it's yeah, like, yeah. it's not what you think it is. He, Jesus and Mary and Joseph did not live in the United States in the 21st century. They were yeah, Jewish yeah. people living in an occupied nation under the Roman government who had a sacrificial system where the priests were corrupt they were sold out they were not even people who um annas yeah. and caiaphas they weren't even supposed to be the high priest they had been placed there herod the great was not hereditary he shouldn't have been there and so it's not what you think it is and so you need to like try to understand what it actually is before you can really understand the dynamics of what was going on do you do you have that uh, story by the by the girl that uh the one um thomas or the or the two sons the two sons one the, the okay one. yeah let me get to that one can, can you do that we have time to do that oh yeah yeah we're flexible we can do whatever so yeah, let me add to this i'm gonna put it on i'm gonna put it on full screen so disciple uh, denies resurrection preparation day thomas a disciple of oh wait Jesus Sorry. Then the crowd at the temple. Today Sorry, just a minute. He openly denied. Let me go to the next one. No, that that was. Uh, I, I don't think that was the one I was thinking of. No, this one. This this is the one. Mm, yeah, there it is. The he told yes. a mysterious story, and there is one I scrap you. They hate him because of his kindness to women like me. And we all heard about the woman they cursed years ago. He saved her life and then forgave her. Today, his story was about two sons. The first said he would not obey his father, but later changed his mind and obeyed. And a second son said he would obey his father and did not. I started thinking, I'm not like the second son because I was never a hypocrite. You know that I never intended to do right. But I'm not like the first son, others because I still do bad. Then his story hit me in the head when he told about the father, give it the first son time to change his mind. You, Father, are the only one who believed me about what they did to me when I was a young girl. So, you know why I have no respect for anyone wearing the long robe with the prayer fringes. But I lis listened to this new rabbi in spite of his robe and fringes. His story about the son who changed his mind gave me hope. I was in my private place, leaning back against the cold base of my collar, striking the door in my left hand, listening to them talk, and remembering you and mother, and I thought, Father, why could I not change my mind? And when I thought then, I heard him telling them to their faces, behavior matter more to Antonius than good intentions. This is why prostitutes will go into heaven in front of you. They almost died from the shock. I started to cry. Well, there's only two more sentences. Let me finish it. I don't know. You know, her. Uh, I'm glad we had the words there because they're pretty difficult to understand. But uh, she says they almost. Uh, yeah, he. Uh, let's see. Behavior matters more to Adonai than good intentions. This is why prostitutes will go into heaven in front of you. They almost died from the shock. I started to cry. Father, what I try to say is this, and I know it is 
much to ask. I know I have shamed you and mother, and I will understand if it cannot happen. But if it is possible, Father, I would like to come home. Your lost daughter, Naomi. I, I actually, uh, the first time I read this uh, for a few years, uh, th this particular letter, which is a letter from a, a prodigal uh, daughter to her father uh, after she had heard how Jesus had excoriated the scribes and uh, told them that prostitutes would enter heaven in front of them. And uh, she uh, crafted that letter to her to her father. Yeah, so I, I was reading it actually just before I came on uh, here with you and it brought uh, tears to my eyes. Uh, and th that that is the kind of person that Jesus connected with. And um, th it's the only way to explain that a person who spent three years here encountered a few people like that, many, many people like that, but almost all of them one-on-one -on -one, mm -hmm. uh, still is affecting people like you, Carla, and me today, 2,000 years later, uh, because uh, what he said to his disciples uh, in private before he was uh, the, within hours of his execution, he said, I will send my spirit to live inside you. And th that is the only explanation uh, for the influence that he has uh, 2,000 years after uh, he was uh, executed. You know, I, um, I saw this. Have you seen the Son of God movie? It was a few years ago. Uh, I, I, I didn't like it very I mean, just in general, I didn't like the, the movie. But the one part that I did like about it was the, um, you know, the part where uh, the passage where Jesus talks about the um, the tax collector versus the the right the Pharisee prays like this, you know, and mm. then the tax collector stands back and he says, I'm not even worthy. Yeah. yeah. And saying that the the tax collector is closer to God than this Pharisee because the Pharisee is stuck in their their pride. Mm. And that was really the only scene of the Son of God movie that I really liked because it showed um, he was as he was telling this. He's Matthew was sitting there listening to him, and you can see the impact that that has on him. Yeah, yeah. and what's really significant is when you know that what Jesus lists there as how they pray that actually is how the Jews prayed in, in that time. Thank you for not making me like a Gentile, a woman, or a dog. A woman. I mean, or yeah, a dog. yeah, yes, yeah. Oh, yes. What? What a, what a great, what honor I have. I'm not a woman. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that, that really was a Jew. So he was, I don't know. I mean, Jesus was pretty, when I read those, when you understand like the cultural context, you see like how much, how confrontational he was so often. It doesn't come across that way to us because we don't get it. But yeah, yeah. he was really uh, throwing some heavy, some, you know, hard punches at, at the religious hypocrites. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, I, in fact, I, I have a story on that. I, I was thinking about reading it. It would take me about 15 minutes to read it. But but the Pharisee, yeah, the Pharisee entered the temple and prayed with zeal to Adonai. Oh, Adonai, our most gracious and merciful. Adonai, I thank thee that I am not like other men. And he began listing all the laws that he kept. He kept them very religiously, and he prayed in fancy heavenly tones, I thank thee, O Adonai, that you have revealed to me the eternal truth of your precious Torah, that I am not ignorant of your ways, like that despicable tax collector over there. And the despicable tax collector over there is his brother-in-law, who has stumbled into the far corner of the court of Jews. He's had a horrible week. The Romans have doubled it, all the, the, the taxes and he cannot raise enough and, uh, to, to, to feed his family. And he's had a bitter fight with his wife and called her some awful names. Only a few were correct. He cannot imagine how things could be worse. And he fell on his knees behind the base of a column and sobbed, Adonai, please have mercy on me. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. 
And yeah, that uh, the, the, that's the kind of that's the kind of teaching that Jesus. Uh, they all said, "Wow, you know, no, we we haven't heard anything. We we haven't heard a, anybody teach us like this before." So yeah, he was. Uh, what an impact he had. You know, um, it's just it's so interesting. Like when you see the the repeating themes all the way through the Bible, right? And uh, I just did in my Bible study this week. Uh, that I did yesterday, it was, so I've been going through the book of Job, like chapter by chapter. And um, usually I only do like one chapter, maybe two, but this time I did, uh, it was the end of the friends round of responses. So it was Eliphaz's, or not Eliphaz, Bildad's response in chapter 25. And then, but the next six chapters are really kind of Job making his complaint to God. Right. And so I did the whole thing because I felt like it needed to stay together. But um, chapter 31, and I don't know, I've like, I can't, I don't even know how many times I've read the book of Job, but before going through it, like in depth like this, I don't know that I ever really understood it. But chapter 31, Job is listing all of these, these things that um, he's saying, God, he's going to God, you know, he's, he's been saying, you know, I'm innocent. If I've done something wrong, tell me. And so at, finally he's going to God directly and saying, God, you know, I've, he's, he's trusting in the goodness and the grace of God and the justice and righteousness of God that God will vindicate him because he hasn't done wrong. And in chapter 31, he's like, have I done any of these things? And so he goes through this list of things that would, that he is saying would bring about judgment, right? And Job is the oldest book in the Bible. And so this is before the law. But when you go and you read the law, like in Leviticus through Deuteronomy, it's basically spelling out the same thing that Job is spelling out in chapter 31 and being very specific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, um, you know, what that is, is like when God was giving the law, he was telling them, you know, if you're my people, this is how I want you to act. This is how you act with integrity. Right. And so what what that shows us is that even knowing those things, it doesn't change the heart. We, we find a way to twist every single law that's there, you know, to our own purpose. And it, it has to be our heart has to be right with God first or nothing else is going to be right because we'll, we'll find a way to mess it up regardless of how good the instructions are. We'll find a way to corrupt it and turn it to our own purpose. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, the book of Job is, is fascinating to me because uh, I've heard so many, almost every theologian I've ever heard uh, talk about how the, the book of Job is kind of kind of beyond our understanding and so forth. And uh, it, I'm not sure. It looks, it looks fairly uh, reasonably simple to me. Uh, there, there's four characters. There's uh, Eliphaz, there's Zophar, there's Bildad, and then there's Elihu. That's mm -hmm. four friends that come along and say to Job, basically, the, the first three, pretty much the same as they said to the blind man. Who sinned? Job, you must have sinned. You must have done something. Okay. And mm -hmm. so, of course, Job is defending himself. Very, very interesting, many of his defenses. But when, it, when we come to the end, and it's time for God to ask Job to make sacrifices for the friends, he only makes sacrifices for three of them. He only mm -hmm. makes sacrifices for the first three. He makes no sacrifices for Elihu. Elihu basically is the young guy who spends a couple of chapters introducing the chapters that God says, where God says, where were you when I created this guy? Where were you when I created this? Where were you? <laughs> you think you're so smart, but mm -hmm. I'm the one who did this whole stuff. And uh, it, it's, it's kind of interesting that the three guys are the ones who need to repent. Joseph, uh, uh, Job, of course, repents, re repents as soon as he hears God. He says, I, uh, I just repent. I had no idea uh, what, what I was uh, talking about. But Elihu never has to repent. Elihu introduces God. Elihu speaks for God. And, and then God takes it over from there uh, all the way to the end. And of course, as a commodity trader, I hate to bring up this point, but 
uh, most of our uh, Christian uh, anti-profit uh, uh, generosity-minded uh, folks would not would, would think we could do without chapter 42, where Job gets all his wealth back, plus a whole lot more. And uh, so it, it's, it's kind of amazing that uh, w while they're quick to judge the rich young ruler, uh, no one's judging Job for the fact that God is the one who makes the point that Job winds up with double whatever he had in the first place. So uh, that's, my, uh, that's my encouragement to those of you who are commodity traders, that uh, uh, Bosky, who said greed, for lack of a better uh, word, uh, is good. Uh, what he really, his problem was, he never came up with a better word, which is profit and generosity and kindness and a whole lot of things that, uh, that Job no doubt was good at uh, as he was doubling his net worth in chapter 42. And it's quite interesting that the Bible does not overlook that. Uh, yeah, the, um, I mean, the thing is, so I don't know, there's people who have all different beliefs. I think what most people would say that, uh, I don't think anybody has a problem against profit. I think what people have a problem with is when, people take uh, not to a point of exploitation other people's work like just for example this is an easy example Jeff Bezos so you know he is Amazon he, he has this this powerhouse of Amazon it was built off of basically he had this massive network of uh, affiliates because you know back in the day ordering things online was a little weird and seemed a little yeah. sketchy yeah. Yeah. and yeah. so he had this this whole army of affiliates that were uh, promoting you know buying things on amazon and so people actually you know you have all these micro publishers that built their own business off of the commission structure of amazon so when he gets established what happens well first of all they cut the the commission rate on most things because uh, I don't know, he was saying it was too confusing for people, and so he's doing us a favor by cutting the commission. And then in 2020, when he, right as everything is shutting down, they slash commissions, some things taking it, taking the commissions away totally, others going from like 8% down to two, and they gave people seven days notice. Mm -hmm. That's exploitation. I mean, that is taking advantage of the situation that they yeah, can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, there's no argument that uh, there's a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of things that are questionable, uh, whether they're in, uh, uh, in business or uh, inside the church. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's no question about that. Uh, but I, I, still, I still say that, uh, obviously, the, the, the confusion between greed and profit motive is uh, is out there. But uh, chapter 42 of Job uh, certainly exonerates the, the profit motive. And I think you no, could. Uh, there's no denying that. I think you could add like, so Mark has this really great book called uh, My Tra Trading Bible, where he kind of gives uh, like an inside look on how, like if you're going to get into the trading world, these are things you have to watch out for and how people can like do you, do you dirty and not even like have any guilty conscience about it. But, um, you know, yeah. going back again to Job too, I mean, that's in this last passage, he's talked a lot about having like these resources and he said if i had made um I, I can't remember the exact wording but basically if if he had made this is not how he says it but he's basically saying if i had made money my idol then i would be under judgment if i hadn't given to the poor if i hadn't stood up for those who were wronged if i hadn't like sought out justice then i would be up for judgment and so he really um he like when people are given these resources 
this is a blessing of God, right? And he, he, Job over and over again recognizes that what he had when he was the wealthiest man in the area, that was because of God's grace. It was because of God's presence with him that he had those blessings and he had that safety. And so he, he says that if I had thought it was, didn't, you know, give honor to God for that, that uh, he would be under judgment. So the thing is, what like when people think that they've been given this, you know, given extraordinary wealth, and they think it's like they have a right to it. There's actually been studies on this where um, it's on consumer behavior and ethics, and uh, they've they've you know research has found it's not just like what the Bible says that the love of money is the root all, of all evil. They they've literally found that when somebody makes a lot of money, they tend to think that they get the right to set the rules and that they're a law unto themselves. And so whatever they do is right. And so Job is actually kind of a corrective to that. It's like, whatever you have, whatever you've been given, you need to honor God with and, and recognize that if he's given it to you, he's given it to you for a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is, uh, that is so true. Uh, Carla, Listen, I, you know, I've been rich and I've been poor. Uh, it's true, rich is better. Uh, but what we have ignored, Carla, is Jesus' comment. It's hard for a rich guy to get into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. He has got a hurdle that to get over that is difficult to get over. It's more difficult to get through a camel through the eye of a needle. Uh, we, can, we can argue about what that means. But the reaction to it, we can't argue about. The mm -hmm. disciples said, well, who's, who, what, what, what person can be saved if that's the case? We've all got enough money then to, be, to create a problem. Uh, to which Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. And uh, I, I, it, I, I agree with you completely. I, we had this discussion uh, mm -hmm. back, back when we were uh, on, in, in the early stages of going from rags to riches with a number of Christian friends. And, and I brought up the point. I said, look, we, we, we can talk all we want about how everybody is handling their money. But wh what's it doing to us? And, and no, no one in that group really wanted to address that question. I mean, they basically said, well, we're, we're, we're beyond that. And uh, I, I beg to differ. I, I don't think we were. Uh, I think it's, it's important to remember, like go back to the parable of the talents, right? Where if you don't uh, produce, and I think what the production is, is production for God's glory, not for our own. But if we don't use well what we've been given, we will be judged for that. So whatever somebody's given, whether they have uh, finances, whether they have influence or their position, you know, wherever you're at, wherever you are, you need to realize that God has put you there for a reason. And how you respond, you'll be called to account. And I think if we actually believed, I, I don't, I don't know. Like if we believed what we say we believe, that you know, someday we will all stand before God Himself, and He will judge the living and the dead, and we every unconfessed sin will be called to account. I think if we actually believed what we say we do, I think we would be living a little bit differently. I, I spoke on <clears throat> here. Here's here's a curveball for you. Uh, Carla, the parable of the talents. Yes, w w wonderful, wonderful parable. W one guy got one, one guy got two, one guy got five. Mm -hmm. But when I speak on that parable, I speak on the parable of the minus. I, I, I did this to a Christian at a Christian university recently, and, and I told him, look, when you hear about the parable of the talents, everyone is distracted on that, especially university students, because they want to know whether God gave them one, two, or five. Mm -hmm. okay? They're sitting next to classmates, and who's getting the who's getting the grades here? You know, we know none of us at university got one talent. We know all of us got at least two, but I hope we got five. Okay, but the minus, they all got one. Every one of them got one, and mm -hmm. one of them produced a thousand percent return. You know, when I challenge theologians with this, they scratch their head and they they cannot figure out any place in the Bible where anybody pr produced a thousand percent return. But my my point is. You all got the same stuff. And who's the judgment come to? The judgment comes to the unproductive guy. Now, this, this drives Christians nuts when, when they think, oh, my, God wants us to be productive? 
Mm-hmm. So to turn a profit, or as some Christian people once said to me, does everything always have to be profit with you? Well, <clears throat> my answer to that is, if I want it to continue, I want it, it needs to be profitable. If it's not profitable, it's not going to continue. Mm-hmm. People who are not profitable eventually go out of business. I want to stay in business. So if I'm lending to the poor, I want it to be profitable enough to continue to, so when somebody gave me some business, some money wants to take to Asia, I took it there. I said, your, your money is going to go on forever because the loan is going to be repaid with a little bit of interest and go on to somebody else. So it's never going to, it's never going to stop. You're not donating to a ministry that's going to need more money next year. You're donating to a poor person who's going to pay it back. And, uh, and that, that's exactly what Jesus was honoring in the parable of the minus. Of course, he does it in the parable of the talents too. But, uh, uh, but, but uh, when, when people realize that, that Jesus is honoring profit motive, they get confused. And that's mm-hmm. why I will, I, will, I will say to, and I say to every Christian, you've never heard a sermon on the parable of the minus. Yeah. You know, know, it's interesting because here, but I'll bet you that none of them have ever heard a a sermon on the parable. You always hear the talents, but you'll never hear about the minus because the minus is just too capitalistic and too profit motive for uh, a a theologian who was uh, raised to think that uh, all of your money should be given to the Lord's work. Uh, They they don't want to deal with the parable of minus. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, in the U.S., we're like so commercially oriented, but we seem to have, we, I don't know, it's just, it's almost like this uh, schizophrenic sort of uh, mindset almost between like, absolutely, yeah, because we, but the way we see our, um, it, it's like a divorce between like what we believe what we say we believe, and then how we live our life, really, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, it's quite a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. I, um, so I've put Mark's website up here, and it's markritchie.me. So he has, uh, I think you have most of your books up, right? I, cause I was, I just have to say, oh, so, yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. So, um, but what was I just gonna say? Oh, so what I wanted to say is like, so Mark, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, he was a commodities trader uh, when he, uh, in his professional life. Um, but he's, this is one thing that I think is interesting because uh, I mentioned this in, uh, I did a, we did a discussion of George McDonald's edition orts and the, the two people that I had on there, the thing about our, the apologetics program I went through, there's some people who go through it that are in ministry, but there's a lot of us who, it's not our day job, you know, we, you know, mm-hmm. we, yeah, we work yeah. and we're in something else. And so the person, one of the people that was on that um, live stream, he's an engineer, but he does this, am- just writes just amazingly. I, I wish I should, mm-hmm. we should schedule something with you and having Seth on here. Cause I think you'd really yeah, um, yeah. connect well with him because he is really involved in uh, missions to like the international students. And mm-hmm. so, um, but I think sometimes people think that only you can, you're only concerned with building the kingdom if you, you make it your profession, if that's what you're getting paid for. And that's just not it. And so Mark, I think you're a good example of that. Like you, you had your career in another area, but you've been in, um, and some of your books reflect that the, the mission work that you've done, um, he has, I'm not even sure how to phrase this, but you kind of do micro lending in yes, certain areas, yeah. right? Yep, yep, absolutely, absolutely. And so it's not just about, you know, I think that's one thing that we need to remember is that we, it's not just about, okay, like believe in Jesus, uh, you'll be saved in eternity, but you're going to be in a mess for the rest of your life. You know, you're also helping, you know, build and bless their life. Yeah, yeah. Today. We're, uh, we're here to uh, make life better for everybody who crosses our path. And uh, that's, uh, that should be uh, our goal. And uh, Jesus did it. And uh, we, we can do it too. 
Yeah. Oh, the other thing too is we probably should have talked a little bit about this in the beginning, but do you want to talk a little bit about your, so you were a trader, but do you want to talk a little bit about your, um, your education and like, uh, your, uh, specifically that one of the quotes, one of the, I think the blurbs, um, for Mary scrapbook was from Norman Geisler. So you just want to talk a little bit about that area of your life? No, but I will. I will. Ah, that's, a, that's an interesting thing uh, that you would uh, bring up, uh, Carla. I cannot tell you the number of people I cross paths with, both in banking and in investing and in trading, who majored in philosophy mm. in, uh, in college and university, and, and, or, or like you in, in uh, apologetic study. It, it's, uh, it's inexplicable. I, I, it, it can't be explained, and it, maybe I could, maybe I could explain it this way. Everyone in my business of trading, investing, and uh, risk taking, and or as we normally call it, yelling and screaming, sold, I'll buy it. You know that if you've seen uh, the the movie Trading Places, mm -hmm. that old old movie, but but a good one, uh, or Jungle to Jungle. The representatives of our industry do it fairly accurately, fairly accurately. And uh, uh, we, we know in our business that nobody knows who's going to be successful in our business. You can't go to school to be successful in our business. And I suppose philosophy at least gets your mind open. In a recent interview, uh, they were saying, "They were saying, what, what, what's the secret? What, what makes it?" Right? I, nobody knows the answer to that. Although I did suggest one thing: if they tell you two plus two equals four, try to imagine it equals something else. Try to think the opposite of whatever they tell you. Here's another way of putting it: if they tell you the world is round, imagine that it might be flat. Mark, now, this is a little dangerous. There's actually a lot of flat earthers now. So pardon me? <laughs> there's actually a lot of flat flat earthers now. That's kind of a dangerous recommendation. Well, look at it this way. Here's here's the lesson. <laughs> if you can't think that, then everyone today would think that the world was flat. And anyone who suggested that it might be round would be laughed at. Uh-huh. You, you, you have to, if, if, or another, another, another way to look at it. And I have a chapter in that, in that one book on the, by this title, we, we have a lot of sayings in our business, but one of them is the crowd is always wrong. Mm -hmm. now, that, that's a, that's a difficult saying. It, it took me a couple of years in my business to understand what that really meant, that the crowd is always wrong. What it really means is the crowd will always move the price of anything you're trading where it should not go. And if you don't think that, you just read about tulipomania. Uh, but in any case, uh, the uh, my my training. Yes, I I, uh, I uh, graduated in biblical studies and went on to get a, a graduate degree in uh, in. Uh, a philosophy of religion, which really uh, uh, converted into a master of divinity. Uh, and how would that help you uh, in yelling and screaming in the pit? In fact, Norm Geisler used to talk about, he said, I, I used to have this student who kind of sat there in class staring out the window. <laughs> we never knew exactly where his head was going. And uh, and he said to me one time when, when we were meeting, he was not only uh, uh, my a professor, but also a mentor and an advisor. And I was working at that time with a little slide rule for computing prices. And uh, he he gave me the example of, of uh, Moses. He said, uh, when Moses told God he couldn't do it, God said, what's that in your hand? And uh, Moses he had, a st had the stick in his hand, the shepherd's stick, and God said, well, we'll use that. And Geisler said to me, he said, if you've got a slide rule in your hand, use that. And uh, uh, that that uh, uh, that was inspiration uh, uh, for me. And uh, years years later, uh, he uh, not long before he passed away, uh, he called me and uh, complimented me on uh, 
how well I had done in following his uh, advice on that. And yeah, it, it, every one of you uh, in your audience has something that you're gifted at. We, we, we started, I was trying to teach them the, the uh, spiritual gifts in Pakistan today. Every one of you has something unique. Uh, I have something, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but, uh, but every one of us, no matter who you are, uh, is gifted in some area that's special and that's unique and designed just for you and uh, go after it until you find out exactly what it is. Um, uh, go for it. Go, go for it. And, and use it. And like uh, Geisler told me, if, if that's a slide rule in your hand, God can use whatever it is. That is really, really great advice. Yeah. And so again, we're going to go back. If you'd like one of Mary's scrapbooks, you can go to Mark's website at markritchie.me and he has a place we can order it. Um, if you watch it on the replay sometime in the future, let me just say there's a limited number. So, you know, if you watch it sometime later, it might not be available, but it's still a very cool thing. So if you miss out on one, you can always like keep an eye on, uh, maybe somebody might be trading Mary scrapbooks in the future. <laughs> Jay Leno used to say, eat, eat them up, we'll make more. In the case of Mary scrapbook, we won't make more. There, There is a limited a number of them. And I'm not sure how good the website is, but send me a message. Uh, you give me a name and address and uh, you'll get one. Even if you don't pay for it, you'll, if you don't pay for it, you'll get a bill. So uh, yeah, but lo love to uh, you know, get them out to you. And thank you. Yeah. Carla, and so that. I actually, so this is the thing. I, if I actually got uh, a couple of these as Christmas gifts one year, um, I sent it to my brother and his wife and also my mom and dad. And so, um, I just think it's uh, it's something that can be like a family heir heirloom. And so if you normally like, you know, reading Luke chapter two on Christmas Eve, this is something that maybe you could add to your Christmas tr traditions, like the beginning of Advent and reading a piece like all the way up through like Easter, because it talks yeah. about that beginning of the church. But mm -hmm. it's it's not just another book. It's it's something more than that. And um so anyway, but that is, uh, I think we're probably going to call it a day. We talked about a lot of different things other yeah. than just a scrapbook, but hopefully um, we'll have to schedule something else to have another conversation because Mark has so many books that we can be talking about. So yeah. Yeah. anyway, so Mark, do you have any final words no, for people? No, you've, uh, you've, covered it. you've covered it all pretty, pretty well, Carla, and uh, thank you uh, very much for for having me on and uh, it's amazing all the all the stuff that everybody's doing and and i, and I guess I, I would just add you know uh yes we're, we're kind of discouraged in america right now we kind of scratch our heads saying what what are people thinking uh, mm -hmm. i heard one politician saying about america people just don't know what to think anymore yeah and i if i encourage you just to think the opposite of what anybody else thinks at least you'll be thinking something uh, original and something new. But at the same time, Carla, I should tell you that uh, one of the countries where I spent part of my childhood in Afghanistan, all the time I was there, I only knew one Afghan Christian. Mm. Right now, there are Afghan families flooding across the border into Pakistan. We just, we just met 10 of them. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell you exactly where they came out of, but they, they came across the border into Pakistan, had to pay off some guards to get there. But it, it is uh, very exciting to see the, it, the, the this thing. We were just talking about it. How did Jesus get us? He mm -hmm. got us because he said he would send a spirit that would actually be in you. He said, I want to be in you. And uh, he's doing that to uh, people around the world, even in Muslim territories like Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and uh, very exciting to see. So I, I guess may maybe that would be uh, just my parting thought that, uh, yes, things look a little bit crazy here in America, but uh, let us uh, lift up our heads. Uh, God knows what he's doing. Yeah, and, and it's uh, not all about us. 
And right. I think our problems would be fixed much more quickly if we got that through our heads. But yes, yes. Anyway, well, again, thanks everybody for joining us. And again, you can visit Mark's website at markritchie.me. But we are going to call it a day and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Blessings. Thank you.